there's a category of buildings that might as well be invisible. They're never photographed or celebrated, even though people are perfectly happy working and living in them. Architects don't even acknowledge them as buildings. That's because architects usually had no hand in designing them. They're old warehouses, old factories, old farm buildings, mobile homes, shacks, all the leftover buildings, cheap and unrespectable. Our eyes bounce off them as if we were trained not to see them. Yet it's in buildings like these that you find the real creativity of a civilization. I call these buildings low road. The main thing about low road buildings is that no one cares what you do in them. Most of these shipping containers in Sausalito, California are used for storage, but no one was upset when I converted this one to a studio for work on my book about buildings. Because I shaped it, it's absolutely perfect for my purpose, far better than anything I could find in an office building and far cheaper. That's how low road buildings work. You spend less money and you get more freedom. I came here as a child uh, during the war. Uh, the Germans uh, were bombing Swansea and uh, my grandparents lived here had been living here since the 30s, and uh, I came here for safety. Built as holiday homes in Swansea, Wales, these buildings were never meant to be permanent, but 50 years later, people have built onto them and customized them to fit their changing needs. Well, I, I've constantly added bits as the family grew. Um, I've put on uh, little extensions to accommodate them. Often uh, I've, I've gone to the beach and, and picked up bits of wood and, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, whenever people throw out wood, I've taken it and used it. Well, this is the, uh, the warm cave, as we call it, where the family uh, gather when the, when the cold winds blow. <coughs> um, we all, we all fit in here. It's very small and very cosy. And uh, three of my uh, children actually uh, sleep here. One of them on this uh, bed up here that I built. Another one here. Uh, another one here. Uh, all gathered around the, the warm stove. And we just, we just sort of spend uh, uh, winter evenings here. This kind of freedom is not always sustainable. There's been a seven-year legal battle between the owners of these 27 chalets and Elite Stone, a property company that wants to use the land for executive homes. Despite the residents' lack of interest in building and housing regulations, Swansea County Council has granted the chalets conservation status and refused Elite Stone permission to build on the site. The battle continues, but at least the council has recognized the rare quality of these homes. Most people have done most of the building work themselves, so while they might not be, you know, they might have done apprenticeships in carpentry or whatever, they're actually very good carpenters and there's mm. people who do, you know, very good elect electricians and plumbers and so people actually kind of mix it and come, come together and help each other with the building work that they want to get done. I mean, if you've got to know people on the field, say you met us all diff out off the field, I think very quickly you'd be able to say which chalet belonged to which person because I think that they very really, they really express the yeah, individuals yeah. that are living in them. The, yeah, 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 and people aren't afraid to express themselves, which is really nice. Some buildings, especially older ones, have areas you might call low road. The cellar, the attic, the garage, the garden shed. They're the leftover parts we care least about, and they're the parts where we feel the most freedom to put in a home office, a workshop, a gym, whatever we want. There's no need to build anything, just convert the space. 
the shed in Beckles. Here in Suffolk, a simple garden shed is now a recording studio owned by a band called the Easy Rollers. They could never have afforded to pay the rates of a professional recording studio, but with this arrangement, they get to make music whenever they want. Making this sort of music, we make sort of dance music, um, you really need to like, at all times, just have your fingers on the buttons and like, you've got the keyboard here and the equipment here and the desk there, so like, you know more than a swivel away from anything you want to twist up. It's pretty, absolutely perfect. It's like the perfect, a living room or your perfect comfortable chair or whatever you like, it's just, everything is just sorted in here. It'd be even better when we get some of the nice comfortable leather seats as well, it'd be even better then. It's probably <laughs> the next purchase because these are terrible, that's these are what we found. These are seats from hell. Yeah. Like all this high tech gear and the worst seats you can possibly get. The most important thing you need when you're doing, doing our music is to have the freedom to have it as loud as you want when you want. Because they come late at night, you know, you do the mix down on the tunes rocking out on both the speakers, you can just go out and have a little rock around the garden. And this is our vocal booth. Just room for one person in there. Perfect. Cozy. Cozy. Well, we'll actually show you, we're getting in closed doors. See? Bye. You can't call me. <laughs> See you later. Thanks a lot. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Bye. This is the Guysfield Snooker Club. Its location is Mr. and Mrs. Butler's back garden. This building we're in now was once a garage and part of the garden. It all started um, really when the children were smaller. You couldn't always afford to go out, and um, you know, so you made your entertainment indoors. So. Uh, that was, that was a lot to do with it as well, wasn't it, really? Oh, that's right, yes. Mm. Yeah, you, you, know, you, say you can't afford babysitters to go out at night time, so we thought, well, eventually this will become a, a good hobby sort of thing, and it turned out to be great. We've kept the score since 1977, and the winning team at the end of each year gets a little trophy. Yeah, so it's 19 years ago now, and I never think of a garage. Never think about it. It's so, so, so it's right It's a now. way of life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's just a way of life now. It's just a way of life. Low road buildings are low rent, low visibility, no style, with a lot of turnover. Most of the world's work is done in low road buildings. Even in rich societies, the most creative people come to buildings like these because this is where you can try things. <laughs> The warehouse in Sausalito, California. running a toy company, Tangent Toy Company, and we've been running it out of this building for nine years. We've been in five different locations inside this building. We keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I've spent more time here probably than I have at home in the last nine years. One thing I really like about it is the high ceilings. You know, they used it to build ships, and so there's like 60-foot high ceilings in here. And um, also, I. I like the funkiness, you know, it's been an old building and we're in kind of a high rent neighborhood, but this has been like a building that's been here for years and it's retained a kind of an old funky quality. Talking about the history about it, it's really fun thinking that they once used this for war and now we use it for bubbles. One great thing about this building is how it inspires me into creating bubble architecture, uh, like the spaceship bubble. Oftentimes a bubble gets away, so we use this to, uh, to, to get it. <laughs> uh, 
Now, people don't do this in normal buildings, you know? It takes a really incredible environment to create inv incredible art like this. Here we go. Do you get that? Right down there. Oh, it's gone. Here in the low rent end of Sausalito, there's a huge community of houseboats. Most of them are homes, but you'll also find all kinds of businesses here. Publishers, law firms, and several software companies like this one started by Brad Weston. We looked at some other office space that was very um, corporate, sterile, and we realized that that's not what we were looking to do, that we would die a cultural death there. And to really eke the creative spirit out of the people, we needed to create a space that was um, uh, conducive. Uh, this is a wonderful space on the houseboats because uh, you walk down the dock and you seem to shed this outside world that we live in. Uh, you know the people, uh, you know their animals. Um, it feels safe here. Uh, one of the issues that we're having to contend with is where do we expand to? Uh, we've kind of joked about having a little flotilla and that we're running, you know, network cables through the water from boat to boat. Uh, and that may very well happen. And we might find that uh, we set up some office space in other places, but that we leave this as a retreat for people. I mean, we often find that, you know, on a sunny day we'll sit out on a deck with storyboarding and stuff and, and create ideas. Or on a rainy day, it's actually quite lovely out here, so we'll build a fire and people will... Um, uh, make tea and coffee and gather around and we'll delve into a session. At MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, the most loved building on campus is not one of the great old traditional buildings, nor one of the new high-tech buildings. It's a leftover artifact of wartime haste that doesn't even have a name. Simply called Building 20, it was designed in an afternoon and built in just a couple of months for radar researchers in World War II. Why do the occupants love it so much? Because it's so freeing. Since it's low prestige space, no one cares what you do in it. It's so simply and cheaply built that it's completely pliable. Some say it's the best experimental building ever built. Temporary is permanent, and permanent is temporary. Projects flourish in low supervision environments, free of turf battles because the turf isn't worth fighting over. I once heard a Nobel physicist say, we did some of our best work in the trailers, didn't we? Low road buildings keep being valuable precisely because they're disposable. The most unlikely buildings can go low road. In 1965, the Elephant and Castle in London was Britain's first shopping center. Architecturally, it was a pretentious disaster. Built like a castle, it had a moat, slit windows, and was green. It had no main entrance. It had no toilets. The place was never fully let, and it went into a free fall decline. In 1992, the owners decided something radical had to be done. The first thing that uh, we did to make it uh, better was to paint it pink and to put the canopy over the drawbridge. The pink makes a statement. And there are, whatever, love it or loathe it, there are a lot of people who feel that they know where the elephant is now. Whereas before it was just a traffic island. Now at least they know that it's a retail unit and it's a centre in the community. So we have a castle design. Here's the entrance, but the entrance was difficult to find. So now we have this beautiful canopy, which gives a welcome to the place. This is the drawbridge, and over here is the moat. Now the moat was, was, was a pretty inhospitable place. Um, windswept, just was a deterrent to use in the building. So we put in a market. The market adds colour, it adds an entrance to the building too. There's some life down there, people feel safe to walk around in it.
most crucial change was to the leasing policy to encourage low road tenants. Instead of the usual 25-year lease, units were let out on six-month licenses for 50 pounds a week, so that virtually anyone could have a go. And if they were successful, they could convert to five-year leases. Now, working with the local community, we put up small structures, which they have then customized to their own needs. centers serve the local community. There is a ethnic minorities around, like Africans, South Americans, and the purpose is to give them an area where to shop their own products. And we developed the upper level of the shopping center, mainly South American, which slowly is growing with more shops every day, given to South Americans with facilities, which in other shopping centers they won't do. Once a month we have a tea dance. The idea of the tea dance is to bring in a section of the community which quite frankly we found were, were a little frightened. They were frightened of what they may have found inside the building. They, they thought it was Hell's Kitchen, that it would be full of villains and that they would be mugged in no time. Well, we brought in a different set of people who attend the tea dance. They enjoy it and, and now it's just part of the calendar. It's a village green, that's what we want. This shabby old building used to be a trouser factory. These days, it's a hub of creativity. The top floor is a seething shanty town of artists. This sort of thing happens in old factories because they're well built, well lit, and have lots of reusable space. Well, we just rented a huge square area here, and we thought of how to divide it into two spaces. And um, we hit upon the idea of just having a diagonal across here. Um, we had to get a uh, chipboard for the walls and um, my, my friend who's Peruvian in fact he he couldn't pronounce the word scaffold so he called them scaffolding and so he got all these scaffolding poles and we devised this system. When you can make adjustments to your space by just picking up a saw you know you're in a low road building. There were originally just two of us, and now there is about six people in the same space because of that changing circumstances. Well, when I first came here, it was just the four walls with a gap for the door. And uh, then my next door neighbor in the next studio suggested that if I was going to burn my fire here that uh, I should put something up over the ceiling to otherwise the heat just would rise and heat the roof and not heat my space so I struggled to put that up and uh, I bought myself a polythene door with some wooden supports and uh, it seems to work. When you get all these odd creaking sounds from the uh, from the polythene and, and the roof it, it's sort of quite scary at first, but after a while it, you feel like you're outside or on a ship, you sort of feel like it's the, uh, the wind in your sails. I suppose it's in tune with the way I would like to, to try and make art in a way. It's shabby and um, chaotic and falling apart. Once artists move into an industrial neighborhood like this, a predictable sequence occurs. They make the place exciting and spruce it up. Pretty soon, there are trendy nightclubs, restaurants, and shops. That makes it a fashionable place to live. Developers move in and convert the live-work studios to upscale apartments. Goodbye, artists. Brad Lockor bought this old print factory because it gave him enough room to live and work, and he wanted to be near other artists. 
one of the main considerations was that the building was, was relatively cheap. Um, for the price of this building, I, I would have difficulty in London finding a one-bedroom flat. I spent a lot of time looking for the space, then out of the blue, quite by accident, I, I came across uh, this place the day it went on the market, which uh, surprised me even then that the developers hadn't snapped it up. It makes me vomit the way local developers have started moving in and buying up large buildings. The problem is that the sort of people that are buying them can afford to pay the commercial rates for, their, for the pleasure of being in there. And so it's distorting the market terribly. The thing about areas anywhere in the world at any time where artists have moved into, the reason why they move into these areas is because spaces are cheap. It would be a very unfortunate thing if uh, this community was broken up uh, by developers selling these spurious spaces off to people who have more money than cents. The same sequence is no doubt already beginning again somewhere else. Economic activity follows low road activity. Developers often are far more alert to what's going on in the real world than architects are. For instance, with the disappearance of attics and basements, there's not enough storage space in most people's houses. So they began to rent space in old buildings like these to stash their stuff in. Developers took notice. In the 1970s and 80s, a whole self-storage industry took off. As usual with cheap space, the word storage turns out to be pretty flexible. You find the damnedest things going on in these places. A boxer working out, musicians practicing, a quiet adultery, a motorcycle repair shop, lots of perfectly ordinary storage. And once a month, somewhere in America, a dead body. Having spotted this trend, developer Ian Lang bought up a 250,000 square foot estate created from ordnance warehouses built for the First World War. Three basic elements, concrete floor, steel frame, and galvanized metal roof make them perfect for virtually any kind of industrial use. Even this dilapidated one is being rented to store timber. There's an incredible range of uses as different occupiers have come in and adapted these very simple buildings uh, in fairly rudimentary, almost domestic fashion to suit their own uses. This basic structure houses one of the many advanced chemistry companies on this site. The equipment inside is worth 10 times the value of the building. Uh, we're working in a fairly high tech, high technology field, which means that we have a quite a wide discipline of sciences uh, engaged in what we do. And a big laboratory like this, and a big building, enabled us to put all of these disciplines in place. Most chemistry labs, as you know, are very small and compact. But what we do here, using automation, and poly polymer science, and robotics, means that uh, you know we need people to talk to one another. So nice big labs, plenty of space to move about, and for people to talk. We've had to put uh, equipment and facilities into the building that we obviously couldn't do to a brand new building. I mean, you're not going to knock about uh, you know, a, a brand new structure in, in that way. The beauty of these buildings is you can knock holes in, you know, knock walls down, um, put quite expensive equipment in a cheap building, and obviously you know, you, your expense is, is, is retained within the building and in, in supplying the building, but the building itself is obviously the cheap part. Ian Lang has run out of real ordnance warehouses to rent out, so now he's building new versions. He knows this kind of building stays in demand, even in times of prosperity. These new buildings take the lessons that we learn from observing First World War ordnance buildings being continuously adapted and molded by occupiers to meet ever-changing requirements. And we embodied a lot of the features that we saw in those buildings. They're very simple, they're very economical for us to build, they're very easy for occupiers to change. They have been 
built to be adapted. A few architects do take notice of the low road. Jonathan Ellis Miller acknowledges that the main inspiration for his modern house was the vernacular architecture of his surrounding landscape in the Cambridgeshire Fens. Local vernacular architecture had a great influence when I designed this house. There are timber frame buildings which have got clapperboard, timber clapperboarded facades. Um, I used that aesthetic on, on the outside of this house. The horizontal lines of the metal cladding reflect directly the clapperboarded um, architecture around here. The second thing is that this is a big countryside, unusual for England, very wide and expansive, and that suits the houses spreading out across the landscape, sitting low in the landscape rather than sitting high up, and this house reflects that directly. The roof is made of the same kind of material that you find in an industrial unit or a petrol filling station. The walls on the outside are again um, industrial metal sheeting. We can learn a lot from cheap low road architecture, ad hoc architecture. It shows that you can use cheap materials which are of high quality. It shows that if you don't try to design things, you let things happen, you let what the buildings want to do inform the design. That means that the, 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 the architecture has a quality to it all of its own. They're not trying to be anything other than what they are. And in a sense, that's a very, very honest way of being. This is my own office. For years, it was a fishing boat called the Mary Hartline. Then it was converted to a sort of floating cottage, but it started sinking, so it was moved here, maybe 30 years ago. It became a real estate office, then a subscriptions office, and then I got it. As far as the city is concerned, it's not even a building. For me, it's pure luxury. You can do almost anything you want in low road buildings. The sheer malleability of the space affects whatever you're working on in a freeing way. The building makes you active instead of passive. Low road buildings are genuinely empowering. Next week, I'll try applying the lessons of low road buildings to new construction. We'll look at what happens when people plan and design their buildings with future development and adaptability in mind, showing how you can really build for change with vision and passion.